Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rogelio Sullivan. I'd like to welcome you to our final technical webinar of the year featuring uh, Dr. James Cooper from uh, Purdue University. <clears throat> uh, we do these webinars uh, once a month, generally on the first Wednesday of the month, and we'll start back up again come uh, August. Uh, Jim has about 30 minutes of uh, technical information to present, and after he's done, we have plenty of time for Q&A. But we have a really full house today with lots of people online, and so what I'd like to do is manage the Q&A by using the chat function in WebEx. So if you look in the upper uh, toolbar section of your WebEx tool, if you choose a chat function, just type in your questions as you go along, and then at the very end, when Jim is done presenting, I will read out the questions and then answer them for everyone to uh, hear. So you can do that anonymously. And this meeting is being recorded because we do post these on our uh, website after the event. So with that introduction, I'd like to give a brief bio of uh, Jim Cooper and then uh, turn the floor over to Jim. Uh, James Cooper is the Jai N. Gupta Professor Emeritus of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University and president of Sonrisa Research Incorporated a nonprofit corporation doing government contract research. He has over 25 years of experience in silicon carbide device research. His Purdue group developed the first SICK power D-MOSFET, the first oxides protect protected SICK French U-MOSFETs, and the first SICK self-aligned short channel D-MOSFETs. Purdue and Sunrisa are currently exploring a new class of power MOSFET that incorporates a tri-gate for FinFET channel in a vertical architecture for the first time. This structure can significantly reduce the MOS channel resistance, currently a major limitation in silicon carbide power devices. At Purdue, <clears throat> Professor Cooper graduated 27 PhD students, 20 of whom authored these on silicon carbide. A life fellow of IEEE, he has served as technical program co-chair of Ice Cream 2017 in Washington, D.C., and co-authored the textbook, Fundamentals of Silicon Carbide Technology. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Jim Cooper. Well, thanks, Rodrigo. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, today I want to talk to you about a project that we're doing uh, under Power America uh, in collaboration uh, with um, uh, XFAB. Uh, foundry in uh, Lubbock, Texas. So we're working on CMOS uh, power ICs, and we're also working on uh, increasing the short circuit withstand time. And those sound like two completely different things. And in fact, what we're doing is, in, in, a, in essence, it's two different projects or two different goals that we're, we're actually working on at the same time. So I want to begin with the second goal, and that is the, the uh, goal of increasing the short circuit withstand time of silicon carbide power MOSFETs. So to set the stage here, let's talk about short circuit withstand time. What I'm showing on the right here is a simple diagram of a, of a switching circuit. I'm going to move my cursor around. Here's our power switching device. It's controlling the current through some load, and we'll assume that this is a resistive load just for simplicity and there's a power supply. And we can plot the uh, current voltage characteristics of our power MOSFET. They look something like this. When the device is in the on state, and the current uh, through the resistor is, uh, uh, or the load, is characterized by load line, and we can draw that in here. Now the current through the load and the current through the power switching device are always the same in steady state. And so the steady state operating point is going to be the intersection point where both of these two devices carry the same current. So at point A, we can plot down here, and, and the voltage drop across the power switch is going to be quite low, typically only a few volts. The remaining voltage is dropped across the load, and this can be thousands of volts. And you can see that the green load line really represents a linear increase of current through the load with voltage across the load. So here I'm assuming a simple resistor as a load. When the MOSFET is turned off, 
there's no current flowing, and the operating point is down here at point B. The MOSFET has to withstand the full load voltage, VDD, um, and so that that requirement, you know, sets the requirement for the blocking voltage on the MOSFET. Now at point B, there's very little power dissipation in the MOSFET or the load because there's no current flowing. At point A, we have power dissipation. Most of that at point A is occurring in the load. There is some power dissipation in the MOSFET because you see we have a voltage drop across the MOSFET and we have a, a current flowing through it. So we have to design the MOSFET for the own state so that the power dissipation within the MOSFET is below some maximum value. That's typically determined by the package and also by how much temperature rise we're willing to accept in the power MOSFET. Now the problem with a short circuit event comes if the load is suddenly shorted. And in that case, the load line rotates to the vertical position. In other words, here there's really no voltage drop across the load. It's a total short circuit, and it can carry any current with no voltage drop. So all the voltage is now dropped across the power MOSFET. And the power MOSFET not only has a high voltage across, it also has a high current, which is equal to the saturation current. Now, the saturation current is really set by the channel of the MOSFET. And the power dissipation in the MOSFET becomes quite large. So the, the blocking voltage can be thousands of volts, and the current through the device can actually be thousands of amps. So we can have millions of watts per square centimeter. And you can write the expression for the power dissipation in the MOSFET. It's the saturation current times the supply voltage and expressed in terms of a power per unit area. We would then divide by the uh, area of the active die. Now, there's tremendous heating takes place in the short circuit. Um, the uh, drain to source voltage on the MOSFET rises up to the supply voltage. And in the worst case, the supply voltage will be essentially equal to the rating rated blocking voltage of the MOSFET. Now, the drift region is supporting this very high voltage. Uh, the um, base to drift layer uh, with PN junction is reverse biased, and the entire depletion region, the entire drift region is depleted. So it, the drift region has a high voltage drop across it, and it has all of the current flowing through it. And so power is going to be dissipated throughout the drift region. And it has a volume, T drift is the thickness of the drift region times the area of the die. Now, if we design our device for the optimum punch through drift region, the equations for that thickness of that drift region tell us that the thickness is two thirds the blocking voltage divided by the critical field. So given a blocking voltage, we know the thickness of the drift region. Now, if we assume adiabatic heating, basically we're saying that there's so much power dissipation and the short circuit event is so short that the heat does not have time to diffuse out. So essentially, there's no heat flow. And in that case, the temperature is going to increase linearly with time. And the rate of increase is proportional to the saturation current density in the MOSFET. So we can write the uh, temperature rise in this way. This first term is the power dissipation, current time voltage, divided by the volume over which that power is dissipated. So this is the power dissipation per unit volume. T is time. Rho is the density of silicon carbide. C sub P is the specific heat of silicon carbide. Now, I can take um, ID sat over the die area and write that as the current density. And I can set uh, VDD equal to the blocking voltage. So I can write this as the current density, which is I over A, uh, time the blocking voltage. I'm going to substitute for the thickness of the drift region this expression here. So I'm going to have the blocking voltage come in in the denominator, and it'll cancel out. And I'm going to get this expression here. 
the temperature rise is proportional to the saturation current. The blocking voltage cancels out, but the critical fuel shows up. And then here's the density and the specific heat. Now, this equation tells you why, uh, why a short circuit event is such a problem in silicon carbide. Because in silicon carbide, the critical field is about seven times higher than it is in silicon. Now, that's really good because it, it allows us to block much higher voltages. But at the same time, it means that we are going to have much greater heating. Now, uh, we can define the short circuit withstand time as the time required for the temperature rise to reach some predetermined value. So we have to determine how much temperature rise we can allow the device to sustain before it fails. Once we know that, we can calculate using this equation, we can calculate the short circuit with stand time. We see that it's proportional to the saturation current, and so we want to reduce that saturation current. That's the key thing. That's the approach we're going to take here. What I've shown here is the equation for the specific resistance of the channel. Now, the specific resistance is the, the actual resistance times the area of the device. So here's the area of the die. The channel resistance is proportional to the length of the channel, so we want to make the channel short. It's inversely proportional to the mobility in the channel, so we want to make the mobility high. And the channel width, and this term, Cox Vg minus Vt, is basically the charge in the inversion layer. So we'd like to have a very high charge in the inversion layer. So maybe we'd like to go to a very high gate voltage to make that a low resistance. But we're limited because we cannot let the field in the oxide exceed some critical value. The number that we typically assume for that critical field is 4 megavolts per centimeter. I think some people use numbers that are lower than that, maybe 3 or 2.5 megavolts per centimeter. But that limits how much charge we can put the in the inversion. There's not much we can do about that. Now, I want to write the expression for the saturation current density. If you think back to the very simple MOSFET equations, the square law equations, you can write the saturation current as mu Cox W over 2L Vg minus Vt squared. So I can write it like that. So I've got mu Cox W over 2L Vg minus Vt squared. And to make that current density, I divide by the dye area. So that's the saturation current. Now, if you notice, these two quantities are just inverses of one another. And so I can write the saturation current as Vg minus Vt divided by 2 times the channel resistance. So what this tells us is that as we work really hard to reduce the channel resistance, for example, by going to a short channel or trying to get a higher mobility, if we can lower that channel resistance, that's a good thing. But we're increasing the saturation current density, and we're hurting our short circuit withstand time. So how do we fix that? Well, I'm going to give a couple of equations as background. One of the things I said we have to be careful about is the maximum field in the oxide. And by Gauss's law, we can write that as the total charge in the semiconductor divided by the oxide dielectric constant. The charge in the semiconductor is the charge in the inversion layer plus the charge in the depletion layer plus the fixed oxide charge plus the charge in interface states at threshold. And we know we have to keep this below some value. I'm going to say 4 megavolts per centimeter. So I want to solve this expression for the charge in the inversion layer. I can write it like this. I take uh, epsilon ox multiply by uh, E ox max. That gives me this. And I subtract these three terms. Now the charge in the inversion layer given by this expression in inversion well, let's say strong inversion, because I put as much gate voltage as I can to get the oxide field up to its maximum allowable value. So this is going to be the maximum charge I can put in the inversion layer, 
that's what I do when I want to turn the device on because I want the charge to be as large as possible so the resistance is as low as possible in the own state. But the thing to notice is that all of these quantities here are fixed in inversion, right? So I know I can't go any higher than EOX max. When I'm in, in inversion, the charge in the depletion layer is essentially fixed because the band bending is too psi f. This is the fixed oxide charge. The charge in the, invert, in the interface states is determined by the position of the Fermi level and the band gap. And the bands have been bent too psi f in inversion, so that's actually a fixed quantity. And we know we can write that as Cox Vg minus Vt. Now, with all that as background, how do we solve the problem? So here's the plan. We're going to reduce the oxide thickness and reduce the gate drive by the same factor, let's say 4x. If I reduce the oxide thickness by a factor 4, I increase the oxide capacitance by a factor 4. But I'm also reducing Vg minus Vt by that same factor. So I'm going to keep Qn constant. So this term here is going to remain constant. So the resistance of the channel is going to be constant. So this R channel is constant. But if I look uh, here, I have reduced Vg minus Vt by a factor 4. So I've reduced the saturation current by a factor 4. I have not increased the channel resistance. So the four times lower saturation current is going to give me four times less heating. It's going to take four times longer to reach that required temperature. And therefore, I have four times longer short circuit withstand. How does that work? Well, here's a plot of the current voltage characteristic of a MOSFET using the full bulk charge equations. And you can see, and, and I plotted this for uh, six different values of oxide thickness. And here's the saturation current. And I've reduced the gate voltage in such a way as to keep the oxide field constant as I reduce the oxide thickness. So you can see that we have a dramatic reduction in saturation current. If I go from 50 nanometers oxide thickness times 10 nanometers, I get over a factor of three reduction in saturation current and a factor of three longer short circuit withstand time. But what about my own state performance? So there you're going to look way down here at the origin where you're carrying only a few hundred amps per centimeter squared. And you can see all of these curves are right on top of each other. I can blow that region up and make it a little more clear. So here at this line is really six different uh, devices plotted on top of each other. These are the curves for constant power dissipation in the device for 200, 300, and 500 watts per centimeter squared. And you can see that the constant power points are exactly the same regardless of the oxide thickness. The slope is the same. The own resistance is the same. Well, this is a bulk charge equation. It doesn't include any short channel effects. So we did a, uh, a 2D simulation using Centaurus for a half micron channel MOSFET. Again, we used uh, oxide thicknesses of 50 nanometers, uh, stepping down to 10 nanometers or 100 angstroms. One of the things you notice here, and this actually was something we didn't think about until we saw the simulations. Look at the slope here. This slope is your output conductance. It's caused by an effect known as drain-induced barrier lowering. What that means is the current through the channel is controlled by emission over the potential barrier near the source end of the channel. And that potential barrier is modulated by the gate voltage. But if the channel is short, it can also be modulated by the drain voltage. And so what's happening here is the drain voltage goes up, the drain is, is pulling that barrier down, and the current is increasing. That's known as drain-induced barrier lowering. And it gives rise to this output conductance. But notice what happens as I makes the oxide thinner. I don't get that effect. I get a flat saturation. So what's happening here is when the oxide is 
five times thinner, the gate has five times more control over that potential barrier, and the drain doesn't have, have the effect that it had before. So you can see that we get almost a 5 inch reduction in saturation current at these high voltages by reducing the oxide thickness. What about the reliability of these thin oxides? Here's an old paper from silicon, silicon uh, days. Uh, but in silicon, uh, SiO2 and silicon, it's known that the thin oxides are actually pretty good. The maximum operating electric field set by intrinsic breakdown increases slightly from 7 to 8 megavolts per centimeter for very thin oxides. And they go on to say that things like charge trapping and interface instability tend to improve with decreasing oxide thickness. So thin oxides are not really a problem as long as you keep the oxide field below the critical field. And that requires, of course, reducing the gate voltage. So it's a very simple idea that we're talking about. We reduce the oxide thickness and the gate drive voltage. This increases the short circuit withstand time without increasing your own resistance. Reducing the oxide thickness also reduces drain-induced barrier lowering. And this may allow the use of shorter channels, which would also reduce the channel resistance. Since the gate charge in the oxide field remain constant, we refer to this process as constant gate charge scaling, or simply gate charge scaling. And the concept can be applied to existing designs, both planar DMOSFETs and trenching MOSFETs. Without any change to the mask or to the process, all you do is reduce the oxide thickness. So if you're with a company and you have a MOSFET process running, a mask laid out, you have a process that you've developed, you don't have to change any of that. All you have to do is reduce the time in the oxidation furnace. Scaling the gate voltage. Now, you might ask the question, um, you might ask the question, how do I scale the gate voltage to keep Cox uh, times Vg minus Vt constant? So what happens if, if I don't know the threshold voltage or if it varies? How do I do this? Well, it turns out that the scaling relationship between the oxide thickness and the gate voltage really does not depend on threshold voltage. Now, the equation I showed you earlier was a simple equation. If you look at it carefully, uh, you can find the relationship between gate charge and oxide field and gate voltage, and it looks like this. So the charge on the gate by Gauss's law is the dielectric constant of the oxide times the oxide field. The oxide field can be written this way. Now let me explain this. So VG is the gate voltage. Phi MS is the gate to semiconductor work function. And psi f is the Fermi potential of the semiconductor, which is determined by the doping. Now you gotta be careful when you write equations that involve a voltage and an electrostatic potential. So this two psi f is the surface potential. They're not the same thing. The surface potential is the band bending. The gate voltage is the quasi-Fermi level splitting. So we need to convert the gate voltage to an electrostatic potential for the gate. And that's why we subtract the phi MS. So this term here is the electrostatic potential of the gate. So I can write this equation this way. The oxide field is the electrostatic potential in the gate minus the potential drop across the uh, semiconductor. And, and this, this is the correct expression for the oxide field. So I'm going to solve this for gate voltage. And the gate voltage, if I have the oxide field up at its maximum value, I just cross multiply by T ox, um, and the epsilon oxides cancel out. So the gate voltage is just set by your maximum oxide field times your oxide thickness. If IMS is known, you know your doping, so you know 2 phi off. So the, the gate voltage doesn't require knowledge of the threshold voltage. Now you might ask, well, what happens if the charge in the interface states or something changes? It doesn't really change the relationship because the charge at the interface can be either in traps or in the version layer or in fixed charge. 
they're all right on top of each other. If you change one, it just changes the other. So this is the equation that we need to use. Now I want to switch quickly to the other part of our project, which is to develop monolithic CMOS power ICs in 4-H silicon carbide. I'm going to go through the process. I'm going to step through this pretty quickly. This is our starting wafer. The first step is to etch the alignment mark. That's not shown here. We're going to make a DMOSFET on this wafer. So we do a P-based implant. And we're going to put the DMOSFET on the right side of the picture. On the left, we're going to build our CMOS logic, and we're going to isolate it from the high voltage that's on the drain. So the first step of the CMOS is to implant the P wells. This could be the same implant as the P base, but initially we're making it a separate implant. Uh, we then implant this region here, which is our N well, and it's isolated by a deep aluminum implant in the same mass in the same implant step. So what this does is this N well is isolated from the high voltage in region below by this PN junction that's formed here, and around the edges, we're surrounding it with a P well. So it's completely cut off from the high voltage, and it's in this in well that we're going to build our P-channel MOSFETs. We may do a, a, a CSL or a JFET implant over here for our D-MOSFET. We do the N-plus source implants. We use the same source implant for our, um, you know, our in-channel MOSFETs and the CMOS and in our D-MOSFET. We do the P-plus contacts. It gives us our base contacts for the D-MOSFET. And it also is going to form our source strain of our P-channel MOSFETs in the CMOS. We do a field oxide that's not shown here. Put down our gate oxide. We anneal that. We put down our gate. We dope it. We pattern the gate. We deposit an intermediate layer dielectric. We open windows in the dielectric. We deposit nickel silicide and form nickel silicide on the front and nickel on the back and do our omic contact annuals. We form our gate contact. That's not shown here. And then we put our top metal and pattern that. So what we have here on the right is a DMOS fit. Here's your, your, your channels, your DMOS fit. Here's your drift region. Over on the left side, we've got a CMOS inverter. Here's our in-channel MOSFET whose source is grounded. Here's the drain. Here's our P-channel MOSFET. Its source is at plus PVP. This could be 10, 15, 20 volts. And the two drains are connected together. They form the output of the inverter. The gates are connected together. They form the input to the inverter. And the whole thing is isolated by this grounded P-well. So again, this is a simple process. What we're doing is adding two implants and two mass steps to the existing uh, DMOSFET process, and maybe just one. If we use the P-base implant for the DMOSFET to form our P-wells for the CMOS, we only need just one extra implant. CMOS logic is very robust with respect to variations in things like threshold voltage power supply variations, junction temperature. We can also implement linear circuits, maybe comparators and op amps and sensors, and monolithic gauge rods and, and protection circuits that could be put on the chip with the same technology. These on-chip gauge drivers and protection circuits will eliminate the wiring inductance, and they can respond faster to things like overcurrent and short circuit events. So we've implemented some digital ASICs uh, application specific ICs using a library of polycells. And the polycells can be interconnected to form digital circuits of really arbitrary complexity. So here's an example. Here's a row of polycells. They have a common VDD supply bus, a common VSS supply bus. Inputs and outputs are brought out into this wiring channel. So here's an inverter, two input NAND gate, two input NOR, three input NAND, three input NOR, and so on. You can also flip this whole thing over and put another row of polycells up here that share the same VDD line. So here's an example of that. This is actually a 19-stage ring oscillator. 
It consists of 19 ring oscillators connected in a loop, and we can use this to monitor the switching characteristics of the switch uh, pair propagation delay of this logic. Here's another example. What we have on the top is, is the same basic logic cells connected to form a full ladder. On the bottom over here, this is an exclusive arm, and here's a half ladder. So these are just some examples. Here's the uh, layout of our initial uh, feasibility test chip. We're putting our devices inside a 1200 volt edge termination. These are going to be fabricated in the same run as and, and in the same chip as power D MOSFETs. Uh, there's a lot of open space here, but that's because we have to put a lot of probing pads to be able to check each individual uh, gate that's in this logic. If this was being implemented alongside a DMOS set, it would be all full of these cells like this. And we're interspersing both power DMOS sets and these test logic gates uh, on the same chip. So let me summarize uh, gate charge scaling. We talked about that. It's a simple way to increase the short circuit withstand time. We think maybe by a factor of three or four without any changes to the mass set of the process flow and without any degradation in the on-state performance or the reliability. We can use that process for either DMOSFETs or the trench UMOSFETs, and they can be also used, this process could also be used for IGBTs. CMOS Power IC technology has the capability of letting us do on-chip sensing and protection circuits that could increase the ruggedness and the reliability of these devices. So our initial fabrication run, we're going to do digital integrated circuits. And we're going to measure the spice parameters of the MOSFETs, including the mobilities and the threshold voltages of both the P and N channel MOSFETs. This will allow us to design the more sophisticated analog circuits or mixed signal circuits that we hope to do in a future fabrication run. And these would include on-chip gate drivers and protection circuits for the first time. So I want to thank you for your attention. Rogelio, I, I will turn it over to you, and we'll see if there are any questions. Thanks very much, Jim. That was a really, uh, really interesting presentation. Uh, sorry for those of you who were having audio problems at the beginning. Uh, hopefully, uh, those are resolved uh, midpoint. So if there are any questions for Jim, please go ahead and type your questions into the chat box, and I'll read the questions aloud for everyone to respond. I mean, for everyone to hear Jim's response. Are there any questions from anyone uh, on the uh, WebEx call? Okay, the first question, uh, Jim, is... Okay, for thinning the oxide, how thin do you expect the oxide to be? Okay, so that's actually a good question. How thin can we make the oxide? Um, and that's a question that I think we all are going to be wanting to address. Uh, that this is actually a, sort of a new knob to turn. People have not played with the oxide thickness. I mean, we we tried to go to shorter channels and, and things like that, but nobody has, has, has thought about thinning the oxides. Uh, in silicon, the oxides are quite thin. They're much thinner than uh, the 10 nanometers or even 5 nanometers. I forget what they are, but they're really only about four or five atomic layers thick, and, and the voltages are correspondingly lower. I don't see any fundamental reason uh, why we can't go down to 100 microns, uh, you know, sorry, 100 angstroms. Uh, I think we've done some devices like that in the past at Purdue. And uh, at that thickness, I don't, I don't see any problems. Um, the, the important thing is when you do go thinner, you have to scale the voltages. So you have to keep that oxide field below the maximum field. And as long as you do that, 
uh, the outside feels exactly the same as it did when it's thick. The only place you might get into problems is if you get it too thin, and we don't know exactly how thick the transition layer is between silicon carbide and silicon dioxide. All indications from things like yields and, and XPS and so on are telling us that it's thinner than two nanometers. So we think um, we think certainly we can go down to 10 nanometers, and maybe even five nanometers. Okay, thank you. The next question is, what happens to the margin of gate source breakdown voltage over VGS on as we scale the gate vo voltage with constant gate charge scaling? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, obviously, if we're going to reduce the gate drive from, say, 20 volts to 5 volts, um, we're more susceptible to noise. And, and you worry about system noise that's generated by switching transients in the system that you're driving. And so this is a question that you really have to ask um, the, the power system designers. And I've talked to a few of them. Um, and surprisingly, they've, the ones I've talked to have said they don't see a problem running with a 5-volt drive. Um, I think GAN runs, I think GAN runs with a 5-volt drive already, and there are gate drivers for GAN that run at 5 volts. So that's, that's what I've been told. Now, the other thing we've been thinking about is, suppose it is a problem. Uh, what we can do with our ICs on the chip is we can do a level shifting circuit. So we can let the, the, uh, let the power system drive the chip at 20 volts, and on board, we can shift it down to 5 volts internally. That's actually the reason we started out to do ICs, is when we realized that we wanted to operate with thin oxides and low voltages, we wanted also to be able to make a chip that could be pin compatible with an existing system that was running at 20 volts. So the idea that you know putting in an ICD on the chips right now is simply doing a level chip. So there may be issues associated with the system that you have to worry about. Uh, but there's, I think there's uh, easy solutions around some of those. Okay, thank you. Next question. How does the size of the CMOS scale with power devices? What do you see for critical dimensions for both the MOSFET and CMOS devices? Yeah, the, uh, with our first run, we're using really loose uh, design rules for the CMOS. And, uh, uh, we, we think the CMOS fabrication in silicon carbide basically ought to be scalable the same way it is in silicon. Because we have, you know, if you have access to the same lithography tools like um, like I-line, G-line steppers, or even DPP steppers, those are hugely expensive. But the question is, um, you know, how small can we make it? I think we can get those dimensions a lot smaller than they are now. Now, the problem you get into with silicon carbide is I have to drive, if I'm going to drive the gate of the power MOSFET on chip, I have a power MOSFET with a really large die area. I mean, it's, I have a large gate that I'm driving, and I have a large gate capacitance, and I have to drive that now with a silicon carbide MOSFET, whereas if you drive it from off chip, you're driving with a silicon MOSFET. So I know my mobility is a lot lower in, in, in the silicon carbide channel. So my driving transistor is going to need to be large. And what we're thinking here is that we should be able to integrate that driving transistor within the array of the DMOS fed itself. So if we want to have a transistor, for example, that clamps the DMOS fed in the case of a short circuit event, we think we can make that clamping transistor integrated with the with the power D MOSFET itself. And so there's, you know, what this does is it opens up a lot of opportunities for innovation to think about how you get around some of these limitations. But that is a limitation that I see. Is uh, I think we can make, looking graphically, I think we can make the CMOS very, very small. We're not doing it in the initial run. Um, but the, the issue comes when we're trying to drive the huge gate capacitance of this large power MOSFET. 
Thank you. Next question is, are there any ESD issues along the way in developing the CMOS module for this process? Oh, okay, so electrostatic discharge issues are the things you, you have to worry about with any MOSFET. And in fact, really with power D MOSFETs or, or power trench MOSFETs, you have the same issue if you have a, a pad there that comes out to the gate uh, and, and is, is, you know, you have, you have to go into the oxide. So we need to put in uh, ESD protection. I, I did CMOS design back in the 1850s or something, back when I was at Bell Laboratories. <laughs> and uh, we, we actually did a CMOS uh, microprocessor uh, that had uh, a huge number of transistors at the time. It had 7,000 transistors and went into production and was in production for like 20 years. And, uh, and we had to put, so we had an ESD protection on that. And so there's ESD protection uh, features that you can put on. Uh, to, so the idea is if you have a static charge or something coming up on one of those pins, uh, you don't want to blow the gate oxide, so you've got to discharge that. Um, so that would be necessary. It probably ought to be done on the power MOSFETs anyway. Just a big MOSFET probably should have it. And they're fairly simple, and, and, but we haven't put them on the initial design, so we, we haven't stuck that in yet. Thank you. Next question. What are the implications of higher CGS over CGD as you thin the gate oxide? Yeah, so you're going to have a higher gate source capacitance. Uh, that that may have benefits in a, in a couple of ways. Um, so one of the things you worry about when you do a switching transient, you've got a gate to source capacitance, and you also got a gate to drain capacitance. When we turn the device off and the drain voltage all of a sudden rises up to the supply voltage. You've got a real high positive DVDT. And that will couple through the drain to the gate capacitance to the gate. And you have this long gate runner. Uh, in the middle of that, or at least at the furthest point from the gate contact, you get you have this coupling capacitance that's trying to pull the gate positive. And so you really would like to have some gate to source capacitance in there to damp that out. Because if the gate goes positive, uh, you're turning the device back on again. And you turn it on in one spot. Uh, so in, in many respects, you want to have a larger, you certainly want to have a larger gate source capacitance than you do gate drain. So I think this, I think this is a benefit. Um, it does provide you more capacitance to drive, but the good thing is we're keeping the gate charge the same. So even though the gate capacitance is going up, the voltage that we have to put on the gate capacitance has gone down. So we're not increasing the amount of gate charge we have to put on and off the device. Thank you. Are there any uh, final questions? Any more questions for Jim Cooper before we uh, end for today? Okay, uh, what happens to the total gate charge to turn on the device, Q sub G, when the gate oxide is thinned? Well, I, you know, I, I think I just said that, but uh, so uh, that's the important thing is we're keeping the gate charge constant. So remember, when we thin the gate oxide, we're also reducing the gate drive voltage. And the prescription is that we have to do those two things together in such a way to keep the gate charge constant. That also keeps the oxide fuel constant. So we don't want to let the oxide fuel get any higher because that would reduce the long-term reliability. But we're not, we're not talking about any more gate charge using this uh, relationship, keep it the same. <clears throat> I'm not sure if you uh, answered this already, but someone asked you to explain again, or maybe elaborate further on how the thinner gate oxide affects the threshold voltage. Yeah, I didn't talk about the threshold voltage very much. Um, the threshold voltage, I don't have a slide for this, uh, but it's the uh, the phi MS, the work function, 
minus the fixed charge over the oxide capacitance, minus the charge in interface states over the oxide capacitance. So if we thin the oxide by a factor of four, we're going to increase the oxide capacitance by a factor of four, and we're going to decrease those other two terms. So the threshold voltage will go down a good bit as we thin the gate oxide. It won't go down exactly linearly with gate oxide because one of the three terms, that's the, the work function, that doesn't scale with oxide thickness. But in general, it will, it will go down. And um, one of the things you do with, with a power device anyway is you try to tailor the threshold voltage. <coughs> Pardon me. Oftentimes, you do that with your implant. So you may put in a, a, a very shallow threshold adjust implant, which acts a little bit like a, uh, a fixed oxide charge that you can insert. So it may be that we want to change that implant profile a little bit to tweak the threshold voltage in. But the tendency is it's going to try to go, up, go down just like the gate voltage will go down. Okay, thank you. Any uh, final questions before we wrap up? Okay, I guess not. So, Jim, thanks again for taking the time and preparing uh, such a thorough presentation. And thank everyone uh, who joined this WebEx uh, presentation today. And uh, we look forward to uh, having uh, this series start up again in the fall. Goodbye. Have a thank you, Thank you. You're welcome.